Um, I lead some of the Iran Digital Rights Project, the Article 19. Um, and I'm also a doctorate student at the Oxford Internet Institute, and I'm studying how various communications technologies emerge in uh, Iran's information control space. Um, and um, if you ever feel like getting in touch with me, my Twitter handle is going to be all over this presentation. So feel free to ping me at that. Um, and just as a disclaimer, it sounds like a little bit of a negative and kind of scary uh, title, Tightening the Net in Iran. Um, yes, there are information controls inside of Iran. Iran does definitely have a government and various institutions that do limit certain rights, both online and offline, but um, this is in no way um, a presentation to cause Iranophobia and to scare you away from it. If you have no security threats, I always encourage um, folks to go and discover Iran. It's a beautiful country. However, the internet might frustrate you as um, some of the details of my presentation will get into. And um, uh, just to give you a little insight into how um, a series of us folks who work on digital rights in Iran talk about um, the situation on the internet, it's um, Iran's information control space is often known as filter nets, and this is kind of a nickname that was developed for the various emerging policies and frustrations Iranians have with the controlled space there. And uh, I believe it was created by a BBC technologist, technology journalist uh, called Nima Akbarpour. So that's something else that you guys, if you are interested in following up uh, more about what's going on, you can um, look up the filter net hashtag in both Persian and English to see some of these developments in real time as people uh, post information and frustrations and complaints uh, online. Um, I'm just... So also for more information, the series I lead at Article 19, like I mentioned before, is called Tightening the Net. And um, Article 19 actually has been leading the way in sort of understanding and translating some of the laws that are coming out um, regarding uh, internet controls inside of Iran. Um, in fact, uh, we were one of the first organizations to sit down and translate and analyze the very complex and um, uh, giant quagmire that was the computer crimes laws um, that Iran uh, drafted and passed in Parliament back in 2010. And following up from that, we've been sort of um, following and understanding the different policy statements and laws regarding the National Internet Project, which we have in um, part one of the Tightening the Net report. Part two looks at some of the software and cyber tactics the Iranian government has been developing, especially against uh, journalists and dissidents. And our last report was about um, was a retrospective on basically the controls and crackdowns that were happening um, following the winter uh, protests that started at the end of December and continued on until the end of January um, inside of Iran. Um, so understanding how this environment works is a little bit complicated as um, Iran is has a very complicated system of governance and this uh, spills over into internet governance. But um, some of the technical implementations of this um, is actually seen in the way that it's structured. And so um, Iran, the head of state essentially in Iran is the supreme leader who is not a elected official. Um, he is a religious uh, official who's um, basically put into power by Council of Guardians. Um, and it's not a democratically elected person. And he is, in fact, in charge of, um, he has the final say in most policies that happen. So if you have been following anything uh, related to uh, the nuclear negotiations that occurred between Iran uh, and the European nations in the United States, um, the government was, only able to engage in those negotiations because the supreme leader basically 
gave the okay for this process to start. If he had said no, they would never have taken place. And a lot of um, Iran's internet infrastructure has become centralized to um, the office of the supreme leader, which makes a lot of the tightenings that happen online of particular concern in Iran. And so um, there is a elected president and he gets them um, uh, put in, uh, put into the office every four years. Um, it's a very similar Republican system as the United States. However, there is a different vetting process and how the candidates get selected. Um, so, uh, the president's, uh, government basically has a ministry of information, communications, and technology. And essentially this, um, elected administration is supposed to have control over a lot of the internet infrastructure inside of the country, like the telecommunications company of Iran, which has access and control to all of the international gateways um, into the country. Um, and they basically uh, govern and control and determine what ISPs have to do and implement a lot of the censorship um, decisions down to the ISP level. Um, However, something concerning that happened back in 2009 was uh, Iran has this body called the Revolutionary Guards, and they're this paramilitary organization that sometimes are referred to as a mafia that basically do uh, the bidding of the most conservative and the most hardline elements within the Iranian system, which is, you know, to crack down on any dissidents, to crack down on any journalists who might be questioning uh, the system of the Islamic Republic or questioning the Supreme Leader's position. And they're really only accountable to the office of the Supreme Leader. And um, they're really well known for being having one of the biggest intelligence apparatuses in the country. Um, they're known to uh, arrest a lot of dissidents and journalists. And back in 2009, uh, the telecommunications company, which was a publicly owned government um, institution wanted to become privatized. And what happened was that the Revolutionary Guards basically bought 51% of the stake in the telecommunications company of Iran, which is very concerning as there's a lot of user data, a lot of um, information related to how internet traffic um, uh, takes place basically in Iran. And it's um, in the control and hands of this really problematic and concerning body known as the Revolutionary Guards. And so that's just a little bit um, insight into how problematic uh, internet governance is in Iran. Something else that actually um, is to go over a very brief history of how things have shaped over the years. Um, the internet really took off back in the early 2000s in Iran when um, Persian scripts uh, became formalized uh, through uh, Unicode processes. And so you saw the emergence of the Persian blogosphere. And um, in the early 2000s, you had a, um, a administration or a president who was uh, known as the reformist and very and known quite as liberal and was very popular. His name was Khatami. And um, during this time, the press was really emerging and was really finding its wings. And so you had a lot of reformist newspapers, a lot of opinion pieces, a lot of questioning of the system. And so the hardline elements, like the Revolutionary Guards that I mentioned before, started cracking down. And there was this huge migration from traditional print media onto the Internet. And so the Internet became this great space for freedom of expression, for a lot of different writers and journalists to start um, emerging. And so it took a long time for the government to really um, understand the space and understand how to control it. And um, so it wasn't really until 2009. So we had some censored websites like BBC Persian um, it was censored in the early 2000s. And you had some select uh, you know, major uh, news websites that were writing in Persian that were kind of um, uh, challenging the status quo in Iran, being targeted and filtered. But there was no real mechanism or process for this until 2009 when um, there was this big protest movement called the Green Movement. Um, and it was in response to the fact that 
a huge demographic or chunk of the population in Iran uh, believe that um, the election was fraudulent and the actual preferred um, reformist candidates uh, were sidelined because of a agenda by the supreme leader, and they put into place a very populist and hardline president known as Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And if you guys are following Iranian politics at all, um, in uh, earlier in the past five six years, you probably would have noticed him making the rounds on the international circuit because he was a bit of a, a caricature of a crazy politician, crazy Middle Eastern politician. Um, anyways, during that protest movement um, that wanted to challenge Ahmadinejad's re-election in 2009, um, uh, there was a huge movement and mobilization of a lot of people towards these reformist and moderate candidates. And even before the election took place, um, it seemed that the establishment was getting really uh, scared and worried about what kind of activities were happening online. And so you had one of the favorite candidate, Musavi, whose campaign colors uh, really uh, defined the green movement. Uh, his campaign colors were green. Um, you had a lot of people uh, within his campaign getting a lot of support. There was a, a massive uh, Facebook groups that were promoting that campaign. And there was um, some of the initial um, uh, activities on Twitter were related to the, these campaigns. And so before the election day even happened, the government went and censored Facebook and Twitter in anticipation of any mobilization. When, um, when, the, when the elections actually took place, um, we, we saw um, mass mobilization on the streets, obviously. Excuse me, there's... Um, uh, uh, answer phone has, uh, going off in the background. Um, so I apologize for that, but it will go off in a second. Um, there is mass mobilization, obviously, uh, offline and online, and it led to the government cracking down and uh, shutting the, off the internet for a period of like 30 minutes to uh, and an hour. And after this, the government kind of realized, or the system realized the power of the internet and things really started to get rolling and you you see all of the, the efforts to centralize all of the different institutions and infrastructures to the office of the supreme leader after 2009 and so um, things like the computer crimes law that were being drafted kind of very leisurely before 2009 um, it picked up speed and by 2010 it was it was uh, voted into uh, law in parliament and it set the tone for a lot of the things that you, we see happen online. Um, things like making encryption illegal came out in this document. Article 10 of the cyber crimes law says the concealing, changing passwords or encoding data that can deny access of authorized individuals to data, um, computer and telecommunication systems, which essentially means that um, it's illegal and criminal not to have any backdoors in anything. Um, uh, that you do online, which is very, um, which is really problematic because most technologies uh, that exist, if you have an iPhone, you have, uh, you're using encryption. So it, it's, it provides these really vague laws that allow the government to basically crack down if um, they could, if they have an excuse or a desire to do so. Um, the computer crimes law also centralized and put into place the process of um, implementing filtering. And so um, there is a committee that's determined, that is uh, tasked for determining offensive content. Um, and the, this law basically says that this committee is within the judiciary and, has, and it's a multi-agency body of various um, stakeholders in the government that um, from within the administration of the Rouhani um, cabinet and from uh, Supreme Leader's office and various other experts who have to sit down and determine whether uh, websites or things like that should be um, blocked. Um, so this took place in 2010 and it's, um, it's kind of an interesting process um, since then all of these different policies. And it's something that I did 
uh, a few years ago with one of my colleagues at the University of Amsterdam, which I was at previously, was to sit down and see how the progression of these policies was um, kind of playing out in um, aesthetically, because in Iran, when you want to go and um, access a site that has been blocked by the government, you end up getting uh, onto a, um, a redirect page. And the government basically populates the redirect page with whatever content they want. And so um, just to give you some insight into how this has reflected into uh, censorship policy, I have a little video to show you for a few minutes. Um, headphones are Bluetooth. It's going to take a while. No. I, my many, many apologies. Hmm. Nope, nope. of the redirect page known as pevana.ir arose with the establishment of Iran's cybercrime laws following the 2009 Great Movement. The different versions of pevana.ir, which contain the literature related to these laws and regulations, evolve as norms of what constitutes as filtered content becomes more entrenched with Iran. From the inception of the very first version of the page, whereby users are told, in the name of God, according to the Computer Crimes Act, Access to this website requested is not possible. The message that users are viewing a censorship page is toned down in the next version, whereby users are only told that the links they are viewing are some of the registered links. Within version 2, we also see the pavana.ir website creating pages related to internet policy. The third version of pavana.ir continues with the theme of religious references with a poem featured that states, if you listen to the words of the poet Saadi, he says he consents to require the consent of him. Immediately to the right of this, users see the text in the name of God and the merciful, as if to subtly tell users that the censorship they are experiencing is by the will of God. These religious references are continued in version 4, whereby the main feature of the page is a changing image that makes references to national holidays and events, maintaining the theme of allusions to Shia Islam and national imams. This this image, for instance, depicts a mosque marking the festival of Imam Reza, asking users to click on a link to submit ideas for the festival. Version 5 of Pevana.ir brings attention to the Islamic nature of censorship. The links featured here are perhaps the most related to state propaganda in comparison to the other versions. While the previous version did not display any links, all previous versions of Pevana.ir featured the popular Persian language blogging platform, Blogva. However, this version omits the website. The omission of the main image in version 5 makes it hard to establish a firm connection between the previous and following versions. This finding is in line with the notion that archives of web pages are not always successful in capturing all of the content. However, further research shows that this version still made use of images regarding Shia Islam. The After the Green Movement Internet Controls in Iran from 2009 until 2012 report by the Open Net Initiative has captured and saved the version of Pevana.ir 
as it was on the 25th of October 2012. This image features Quranic writings. The last two iterations of the website in version 6 and 7 are very similar in design. The sudden change in design was explained by an anonymous source to make filtering more pleasant, or rather to appear as a subtle part of the Iranian internet experience, rather than one presented with indoctrinating aspects of the government. The significant change that comes in version 7, however, is the prominent feature of the internet policy links. Concluding, we can say that this historiography of the Paybana.ir website demonstrates a timeline of the beginning of the heightened internet controls from the inception of the page in 2010 to the present day. The changes in the page essentially demonstrate the evolution of the way the Iranian state represents its censorship policies. The notions of religious motifs decrease over time, whereas the focus on internet policy becomes more present by the last iteration of the page. So that was just a brief look into how policies um, have tried to become more streamlined and centralized over the years. Um, some of the things that we've been noticing um, have been different programs that have been trying to further control online. Um, one of the projects that we have been following, especially in terms of um, seeing how various activists and users at risk inside of Iranian civil society and within um, uh, human rights groups uh, within the diaspora uh, have been affected is um, one program that um, a body within the Revolutionary Guard named as Gerdob uh, has developed and they publicized it very um, highly, I think, in efforts of trying to create intimidation amongst Iranian internet users and especially any um, activists or uh, journalists doing any kind of dissident writing. Um, is the the spider program, and um, uh, I can get a little bit into it uh, later on. But basically, the spider program um, it it was publicized as having control over all of the users' data. Anything you do on social media is basically being monitored, and um, which uh, I think, as many technologists would know, is very difficult unless you're actually working with the platforms and uh, most of the social media platforms that Iranians are using uh, en masse are not local. They are foreign platforms like um, Facebook's Instagram in Iran or Telegram and um, unless they are cooperating directly with these companies that's very hard to do. However, um, they have had other tactics of doing this which is actually through physically seizing things. So there was um, a whole uh, roundup of uh, arrests that happened back in 2015 where there were various fashion models um, being rounded up inside of Iran who were Instagram celebrities. And um, they arrested them and basically through interrogations they forced them to hand over passwords. And so these really popular um, uh, Instagram pages that Iranians followed all of a sudden uh, were taken over and had this um, uh, had the page say um, through the spider program of Gerdab, these pages have been essentially taken over, but really they were um, uh, through uh, physical seizures. Um, we also have been seeing the development of the National Information Network over the years, and this is sometimes known as um, the Halal Internet. And uh, this began under um, the Ahmadinejad administration. But again, it was sort of part of um, a grander policy set in place by uh, the Supreme Council of Cyberspace, which at its head is the Supreme Leader. And um, this is basically the main aim of the National uh, Internet Network. Um, some people have feared that it's um, being built to cut Iran off from international traffic and to make them reliant on a domestic internet in the same ways that uh, North Korea administers its um, online activities. Uh, however, um, part of the reason for creating this was to protect um, Iranian infrastructure from cyber attacks from, uh, from actual threats from Israel and the U.S. I mean, uh, 
things like the Stuxnet attacks actually did have um, real consequences for Iranian economy and the Iranian uh, for Iranian institutions. And so, um, as part of uh, national security, in some ways it does make sense. However, it does actually have real consequences for controls online. And I'll explain a little bit about one of the major concerns and how it's related to Telegram a little bit later on. Um, the Iranian government, especially the um, this administration of Hassan Rouhani, has done a lot to um, try to promote policies that um, um, basically present the fact that they want to do more efficient or productive forms of censorship that can, um, you know, uh, put in place morals online without making the internet this, you know, cumbersome uh, place full of hurdles. So uh, they were basically saying they want Iranians to access Facebook, they just don't want them to access the immoral content on Facebook. And so they started um, uh, advertising the fact that they're spending millions of dollars on this process of intelligence uh, censorship. And um, again, uh, Iranian um, policies oftentimes put a lot of effort into the PR as opposed to the technological um, realities of what they're doing. And so they were saying that the best engineering schools were working on uh, processing intelligent filtering across the internet. And the only real life result of all of this work and all of this advertisement and apparent budget they were putting into this was um, back in 2015, um, it was discovered that intelligent filtering was being rolled out on Instagram. And um, users started reporting how this was happening. And um, uh, through some work I did with a colleague, we, we kind of um, sat through and um, uh, through snowball effects across all of these different um, uh, Persian Instagram pages we kind of uh, figured out what pages the government were targeting. They were mainly uh, fashion and cultural pages, um, things really related to um, uh, women and how women were being presented online. And um, we also discovered that the only way that the government was able to technically implement this was because of a fault that uh, lay in Instagram's own, um, uh, in Instagram technology, which was the fact that uh, the platform wasn't encrypted and thus uh, the Iranian government was able to individually block pages. Um, the platform was encrypted and using HTTPS on the browser version, but the mobile application had not yet rolled out encryption. And this was um, uh, part and parcel because they just hadn't had time to do, implement this yet. And so um, through work with my colleague, we uh, alerted this to Facebook and got into discussions with them. And soon afterwards, um, around the same time, uh, in May of 2015, uh, Instagram rolled out mobile encryption and um, Iran's grand uh, intelligent filtering project kind of was um, dismantled and didn't really uh, amount to very much, which um, I think underlines some of the grander themes that happen in terms of uh, internet policy and reality, which is a lot of grand statements and gestures that don't really amount to very much. Um, also, uh, again, I didn't show this slide before, but this was the grand um, hacking attempts that they had. So this is a page, uh, a fashion uh, page for a fashion blogger that was seized. And basically, um, this uh, Instagram feed here, which was taken over through arrest and interrogation, which also consequently tried to uh, request me, request to follow me on Instagram as well. Um, uh, it says that through the spider program, uh, the account was seized and taken over. Um, uh, other attempts uh, by the government to try to uh, control what's going on online has been obviously a lot of attention on Telegram, uh, and I'll get to it a little bit further down, but um, back in 2016, they implemented a new policy where they asked uh, panels 
that had over 5,000 followers had to go and register with the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, sometimes known as Ershad. And um, basically the administrators had to give over their personal information. And this, through some of the work I've been doing with Article 19, we've tracked over eight arrests that have used this registration process to crack down on various groups. So in the lead up to the 2017 uh, election, um, where President Rouhani was reelected, um, there were a number of telegram channels that were um, moderate or reformist oriented. So these are the political factions that are a little bit uh, on the left. And they were supporting um, Hassan Rouhani, who uh, has a lot of tensions with hardline elements within the Iranian system. Um, there were roundups of a lot of these administrators that were promoting um, his work by the Revolutionary Guard, and a lot of their information was found and accessed through this registration process, um, which is quite problematic. Um, the government also, through the registration process, attached a bot to the channel, so they were able to monitor who was following the various channels on Telegram, and um, which is highly problematic for a lot of security reasons. Um, just to go over some of the political context in Iran, um, and I alluded to the fact that um, uh, politics is a little bit complicated uh, in Iran, and this affects um, how uh, internet policy plays out as well. Um, President Hassan Rouhani came into office in 2013 with a lot of um, promises about how he was going to improve internet access. Um, but, and some of those promises and um, uh, values came to fruition with the fact that things like internet bandwidth did actually increase throughout the first term of this president. Um, there was a lot of uh, small towns and villages that didn't have access to the internet that so suddenly were being connected. And so a lot of this infrastructural work for access was being improved under this president. However, um, he also did make a lot of promises about how they weren't going to censor any more platforms. And so one of the biggest achievements previously, I mean, up until um, April, was the fact that um, uh, his, his administration was able to stop members of various hardline institutions in Iran, such as the judiciary, from blocking Telegram. And so um, Telegram and Instagram are were popularly one of the only four in social media that was not blocked in Iran. Um, however, some concerning things that have uh, happened was the fact that about a year ago, um, after his re-election, he uh, put into place a new minister of ICT, his name is Azari Jarami. And um, a lot of, especially human rights organizations, became very concerned about the fact that um, this moderate and popular president who was uh, elected during both elections on a mandate of reform and progress and, you know, living up to rights, um, uh, was putting into place uh, this individual. And he had a history of working with Iran's intelligence apparatuses. There were a number of different activists who said that he was actively involved in their interrogations when they were arrested in 2009. He also uh, worked within the intelligence to help build up um, online surveillance systems uh, within various intelligence uh, apparatuses inside of the country. He's an engineer. Um, he was mainly, <coughs> excuse me, mainly um, promoted because of the fact that he's quite young and he's going to be very innovative, but at the same time, he has this kind of tarnished past that was concerning a lot of people in terms of what he was going to do. Um, when he was put into place, he did say that he was going to try his best to keep things accessible and not censored, but he said um, he was going to do this by trying to establish connections and uh, ties to um, uh, like the telegram administrators. And so famously during um, the Iran protests that were happening in December and January, um, 
uh, Daromi was tweeting at uh, Pavel Durov, the founder of Telegram, and asking him to take down certain channels that were extremely popular and um, were helping with mobilizing the protests. He, he alluded to the fact that they were violating Telegram's terms of use by inciting violence. And so um, you, we have this very problematic individual pursuing these um, problematic uh, policies, including uh, the National Information Network, which I'll get into a little bit because it has a lot to do with the situation of Telegram in Iran. And so um, it's almost impossible to talk about the Iranian internet and not talk about Telegram. And this is, has been um, part of my fascination for the past few years. Um, I started really uh, following the impact of Telegram on communications in Iran during the 2016 parliamentary elections that happened in Iran because um, at that point um, uh, you had something like a, a huge sweep in terms of um, reformists and moderates being very successful during that election. And this was seen largely in the fact that you had a lot of reformists and moderate members of parliament being very savvy in their use of Telegram. And so they had videos and they had campaign materials that went viral on the platform. And so it was then that you could really see the impact in terms of mobilization and in terms of uh, political clout that this platform could have. And why did this platform have so much clout? Well, um, it, it, it's kind of like developed as this really unique and indigenous tool to Iran because uh, back in 2015, um, I mean, how Iranians come to use their tools, I think essentially has to, a lot to do with localization and usability. And so you previously you had uh, Viber that was extremely popular. And I think that had a lot to do with the way it was designed. Um, Iranians could easily uh, share stickers with um, you know funny uh, messages in Persian, like there's tons of sticker packs and things like that. It's um, really fun. And so um, in 2015, there was a massive campaign done by the government and uh, various other media to discredit Viber for having ties to the Israeli government. And Iran started swaddling Viber connections. And so there was a massive migration of all these Viber users onto Telegram. And at that time, Telegram hadn't started its public channel functionalities. And so you had all of these users go onto there and then they realized they could also use it as a social media. So there's private messaging and then it becomes a social media platform. And so Telegram has basically become ubiquitous with internet use because of this ability to communicate freely, get contact freely. So you have something like BBC Persian, which is blocked inside of Iran, but you can get all of the content from BBC Persian. You can get videos from news broadcasts and everything on this uncensored platform. For a while, there was a lot of speculation on why um, Telegram wasn't being censored and like Facebook and Twitter were, were being censored. Um, uh, I, that's mainly speculation, which I won't get into, but the reality of the fact is, is that um, you, have, you have about uh, 40 million users on Telegram, and you have something like 45 to 50 million users online in Iran. And so it had huge impact. And since 2015, the Iranian government has come to many deliberations on whether or not it should have been filtered or not. And so it really became a heightened crisis with the protest movement. And we saw, like I said before, the minister reach out to Pavel Durov, asked to do content takedowns which initially Pavel Durov did respond to and did remove that one channel, I think um, through various um, reactions. So Pavel Durov stopped responding to any of those content takedowns and made took a very firm stance on uh, wanting to encourage internet freedom uh, inside of Iran. Uh, but um, basically through the national information uh, Project or the National Information Network, Iran has been trying to pursue this goal of trying to localize all of the data and content 
that cribbed on the internet to inside the country. And so there were um, numerous attempts by the government to try to um, um, create alternatives for all these foreign platforms. So you had things like Lenzor that was trying to be an alternative to Telegram, wasn't very successful. And so they weren't, um, they tried to create various alternatives to Telegram over the years and they weren't able to be very successful. So they created all these different ultimatums that they, ho they hoped that Telegram would be responsive to. And so in 2016, they gave them an ultimatum that said that if they don't move their servers inside of Iran within a year, they would be censored. And so a year came and passed and they weren't censored. Um, at, but however, in uh, during the summer of 2017, what did happen was that Telegram moved its um, content delivery network to inside of Iran and they announced that they did this in order to make it more efficient for Iranians to download and upload content just because Iran has the biggest user base of um, Telegram users. And so the government kind of presented this as um, Telegram complying with their uh, demands to localize and bring data inside of the country. Obviously, this wasn't enough. Um, Iran came out with, well, the Supreme Council of Cyberspace came out with um, uh, a, new, a new directive that was ordering every single platform that wished not to be censored in Iran to comply with various data laws, which meant that Iranian users must have all of their information on servers inside of the country, which essentially would mean that the government would have access to those servers and to that data. Um, uh, when the directive did come on April 30th, that gave the, the final order to block Telegram permanently. Um, they alluded to the fact that Telegram wasn't complying with um, with these Iranian directives, and um, they, I mean, it, there was a bunch of other reasons, but that was one of the, the concerns. Um, it must be strange, though, to be talking about Telegram at a security conference because I know that Telegram doesn't have the best reputation among cryptographers. Um, uh, there are a lot of problems with with Telegram. Um, obviously, uh, it's not end-to-end -end encrypted by default. And um, had the Iranian government actually asked for the servers to be located inside of Iran, and they had um, actual encryption by, by default, it wouldn't necessarily have been a huge concern. Um, however, um, they could potentially have access to this information. Um, there have been other security concerns with the fact that um, there have been numerous SMS um, hacks on a lot of journalists and activists inside of the country where um, elements within Iran's intelligence have been able to access these accounts um, through these uh, types of attacks. Um, we've also seen uh, lots of targeting of various um, different uh, members of civil society inside of Iran who are using Telegram. And um, Telegram has been a little bit, hasn't been very proactive in making sure that they are um, taking care of the security of this giant user base inside of this country full of so many at-risk users. So there is that kind of element of criticism to be had for um, Telegram. What is most concerning, however, right now, besides the fact that we can spend a lot of time criticizing Telegram security, there's an even bigger kind of concern right now, which are the alternatives that the Iranian government are pushing onto Iranians. Um, they are not being entirely uh, successful in doing this, however, um, they have policy for like university students. If they want to get any updates or information about what's happening with their courses, their programs, or their departments, they're being forced to uh, go on to the alternative to Surush. I mean, the alternative to Telegram, which is this government-developed platform, which looks exactly like Telegram. It functions the same way with the channels. Um, so they have to get onto these platforms now to get access to that information. And um, it's been audited by different researchers. So 
even the government officials who have their channels on these platforms, researchers have been able to look into some of the back end of the platform and they can like uncover uh, the phone numbers, the personal phone numbers of these different officials. And so there's a lot of holes in it. And obviously the data as given the fact that encryption and this, this kind of security is not um, even legal inside of Iran, Sarush, this platform, all of the data can be easily accessed by Iranian officials. So these kinds of privacy precautions are, they go to the wind um, when it comes to these platforms. Um, there have been a numerous amount of projects that are trying to find um, alternatives to, uh, to Telegram. So we have, um, when Telegram was blocked in Russia, which was about a week prior to the block in Iran, um, Pavel Durov came out and said that he was putting some of his own money into developing projects to resist um, the censorship. And so he actually gave uh, a, a, an amount of funding to two Iranian internet researchers and activists based in London, who I know um, personally, and they created a platform called Telegram VR. Now, one of the reasons why I really like coming to the conferences and talking to rooms of technologists and security researchers is because um, uh, because the Iranian internet environment is such a you know volatile and uh, sensitive uh, areas. I, I I love to um, mobilize uh, these audiences so. Uh, these really well-intentioned friends who created this platform that now has over a million users and is, is extremely useful um, is uh, a platform that should be audited and should take uh, good security precautions. So I really urge any security engineers here to go on and find the Telegram VR code on GitHub, audit it, and um, make sure that these uh, alternatives for Iranians to access communication are as secure as possible. And um, that kind of brings me to um, my last point, which is discussing a little bit about how um, you talk about security in Iran. And it's um, one of the projects I work on with uh, various networks of um, uh, Iranians outside who work on human rights and who are often, um, who have the Iranian government as a adversary doing this type of work, which is sort of um, the culture of security. Security is often seen as a very low priority. And I mean, given the fact that you have something like Telegram that arose as this hugely popular tool um, over so many other alternatives that a lot of people uh, within the cryptography and security communities would uh, recommend over it, kind of shows that usability and design and features rank much higher than these security features. And so, um, yeah, digital security is not so much um, a huge concern. Physical security is often seen much more important, although um, your online security feeds into the physical threats as well. For example, if you are not taking care of your digital hygiene and you go into your interrogation, you could compromise your case and how you're treated when you're um, physically detained. Um, so how, um, how a lot of different trainers and um, uh, technologists approach this field I think is really important and um, these kind of one size fit all recommendations don't always work. I, I know a lot of folks have been saying, oh, well, it's good that Telegram is blocked, so you can go use a more secure alternative like Signal, and you should always use Tor as your circumvention tool. And so um, just one of the last points I wanted to leave this talk on is, yeah, don't always use Signal or use Tor. Um, think about the context uh, um, as technologists that various um, users are operating in and um, yeah, try to uh, help and improve the technological environment. With that note, I will say thank you and my apologies again for not being able to be there 
in person. And thank you so much for letting me ramble on. All right, thank you very much. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, I think it's going to be easier to continue this discussion uh, over on Twitter, so your handle is here. And for those of you who are on site, uh, we will reconvene here in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much.